Yeah, so um, a lot of the previous speakers actually have been addressing the question of monsters and demons, which uh, is perfectly good for this uh, closing talk, which is the AI collaboration monster. Um, the, uh, uh, okay. So the idea is like, how do we actually find ways to fight Moloch in the age of AI? So for those that are not acquainted with this particular monster, uh, Moloch is described as, like it's used as the metaphor for like the game theory monster in which people actually are encouraged to compete with one another, actually leading to this kind of race to the bottom in which at the end everyone actually loses. And even though everyone can see that everything is going to its own demise, then because of the game theoretical incentive, they cannot actually get out of this race. So, um, what I want to propose today is an alternative to the Moloch, and it's another monster, which uh, we call the collaboration monster, which is actually designed to change the payoff structure of this uh, game theory in order to actually turn collaboration as the dominant strategy, where everyone that actually choose to collaborate will win, and uh, the one that continue to try and compete might actually be the losers. And obviously, the idea is that the more the, the more people start collaborating with one another, the, the larger the collaboration monster gets, and therefore it can further increase its strength. So why do we actually need a collaboration monster? Uh, because today the AI ecosystem actually encounter quite a few challenges. Uh, first and foremost, a AI safety and alignment, but also there is like, it becomes harder and harder for like, small actor to access data or compute resources. And then, of course, we have also, also like those kind of dominant players that are running and operating uh, large AIs. Uh, and there is all the question of trust and ethics and like the centralization of the control uh, that those, those corporations actually have. And so uh, there is also a lot of discussion about the dangers and the threats to opening open source AI and so forth, which is also obviously a good narrative to use for those corporations that actually want to maintain the control over those AI systems. And so today we have like an ecosystem which is uh, highly centralized into a few dominant players um, that are kind of like uh, co-opting the, the market, it becomes really hard for new players to come in into the market and actually compete on a level playing field. And so, uh, essentially, we actually can welcome the new AI overlord, which is, again, Moloch. Um, so, how can we actually overcome this? Well, so we have on the one hand Moloch, which is the representative of the corporate AI. Uh, we also have like the public AI movement, uh, which is more like represented by the Leviathan. Um, and then the question then is like, what monster will that be? The one that is more like the civil society monster of like an AI that is actually uh, steward by the people and for the people um, in, a, in a less uh, market-driven and profit-oriented approach. Uh, so the AI collaboration monster is based on three premises, which are actually quite, uh, quite draconian, but that, that's kind of like the filter mechanism for actually being uh, interested in joining the collaboration monster. One is collaboration, monster, uh, collaboration can be a source of competition. Uh, it can provide a competitive advantage. Uh, openness is a precondition for trust. And interdependency can actually be used as a way of increasing sovereignty because then we are no longer dependent on uh, those dominant corporate players. So, um, so how do we actually do it? Uh, it all starts with a very simple trademark. So for lack of a better name, let's call it alien intelligence trademark. And then this trademark is associated with a charter. And the charter can include a variety of things, uh, including some AI alignment principles, some ethical rules, privacy um, commitments. And so everyone that actually wants to benefit from the use of this trade, trademark or logo uh, also needs to abide by the condition of the charter. And so it creates this kind of self-selection where the charter is actually the licensing tool for the label and people can self-select themselves. If they do follow those rules, they can actually use the, the, the label. But of course, this also creates a legal commitment to actually following the rules. And so as opposed to companies that might say, I commit to this type of alignment principle, but then they can change their mind at any time. Uh, here, there is actually an IP infringement uh, because they shouldn't be using the trademark otherwise. Um, 
So this creates a little bit of a stronger commitment to the charter. Um, but then what about, so this is great for like defensive purpose, but then what about collaboration? How do we actually encourage collaboration within the members of this, uh, of this network? Uh, and so first of all is the possibility of like mutualization of resources. So the people that join uh, this charter can also create rules that they will mutualize specific resources. One could be like access to training data. The other one could be actually the collectivation and the sharing of compute resources that with a privilege and priority between the people that joined the network. Uh, and, but then we're only into collaboration and then where is the monster coming in? Uh, the monster actually comes when in addition to defensive system and mutualization of resources, we also add the entanglement layer. Uh, and the entanglement layer is also achieved via, uh, via uh, intellectual property, uh, which is what we have uh, defined as the copy fair license. So copy fair as opposed to copyleft, which is it's open for everyone at the condition that other people will, if you make a modification, you put it back into the same pool. The copy fair actually is, uh, um, is, is a conditional public license. So anyone can this define what are the boundaries of the actors that can benefit from this license. It is open in the sense that everyone can see and look, so it's open state, uh, but not necessarily open in the terms of use, with the exception of the ones that are part of this particular boundary condition. And so you can create like a membership that has the people that actually fulfill the charter can have access to like commercial and like privileged access to the, to the IP. Um, but the people that do not actually follow the charter then still are under a traditional uh, proprietary license. And so um, you probably all have seen this picture. So uh, by aggregating a lot of little actors into one entangled entity, then perhaps there is a chance to have actually competing at least um, through collaboration against the various actors. And then basically there is multiple degrees of entanglement and depending on the degree that we pick, then this collaboration monster will be more effective uh, in the market. Uh, so one is the shared IP, then we can go further and actually and, uh, enabling some kind of profit sharing within the network. Then we can go even further and actually engage into risk sharing, so like sharing equity between the various actors. And then eventually even further actually engaging into some kind of like control uh, and so sharing and creating like some, some degree of collective governance. And of course, the different degree of autonomy uh, will depend on the degree of entanglement, but the more entangled uh, the, the actors are within the collaboration month, so then the stronger the collaboration month gets. And so the idea is that we have like very high entry cost because like entanglement is actually costly, but those entry costs actually create high exit cost. And the exit, the, the highness of the exit cost is important because it actually creates a solution to the tragedy of the commons, which um, which is the idea that if you have like common resources, it's hard that everyone is, has an incentive to free ride. Uh, some, some propose that the solution to the tragedy of the common is privatization. Others say that we just need a lot of sanctioning and monitoring. And then instead, we, we're proposing that actually mutualization and entanglement is an alternative way to actually resolving the, the tragedy of the commons because if actors are actually more and more entangled with one another, they have less incentive to free ride because they are free riding on themselves. Um, and so the idea is that we need to not only uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, there is like a lot of interdependency that already exists, but actually we can increase and further augment the degree of interdependency through this voluntary opt-in entanglement, which therefore contribute to this stronger entity. Um, and then, of course, the big challenge uh, is that the, the AI collaboration monster is itself a commons, and that means that there is a lot of common question to be uh, to be ad addressed, which is what is the collective governance within the collaboration monster? What are the membership criteria to decide who gets in and who gets out? And then how do we actually amend the provision of this charter? Because of course, as new actors come in, uh, there needs to be a way that, because they are entangled, and they also need to participate into this governance. Um, that's it. Then go for it. Okay. Uh, have you looked at Eleanor Ostrom's work? Yes. Yes. I, I felt uh, she, it was kind of she uh, felt like she was moving behind the monster. I, I will actually. I would like to um, make a specific. So I think it's pretty much 
slightly different. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very strong fan of Elinor Ostrom. At the same time, Elinor Ostrom actually claims that the only way in which you can actually manage a common space resource is by having the second one, Monit unless you want to privatize monitoring and sanctioning. Um, I think with the collaboration monster, it's actually trying to find a, an alternative aspect of it, which is actually we no longer need monitoring of sanctioning. Monitoring and sanctioning is because there is still the incentive for free riding, that, that there is like a bad payoff structure if you need to monitor and sanction. The idea is actually let's introduce an alternative mechanism of mutualization and entanglement, which will change the payoff structure so that the incentive for free riding is actually gone. And so you need much less of monitoring and sanctioning. So it's kind of like, tackling the same problem of like common based governance, but providing a slightly modified solution yeah, to it. Yeah. Uh, just in light of Christian's talk, it might be that you want the monitor and sanctuary to care, prevent the Darwinian demons from invading <coughs> the common solution. I think that is the immune system. Yeah, yeah. but that's from the outside. Uh, like, yes, I mean, I'm not saying you, you want to... <laughs> I'm not saying you want to remove it completely, but it's, it shouldn't be the primary source of solution against the tragedy. It could be like a nice to have somehow. Yeah.